Hey, church fam and friends, welcome back to Theology 101. We are continuing our series going through a study of Christology, the study of Jesus. Uh, we have looked at who Jesus is, and now we're in the middle of looking at what Jesus does, the works of Christ. And specifically today, we're looking at Jesus's earthly ministry. In the previous episode, uh, we had looked at his pre-incarnate ministry, basically asking the question, what did Jesus do uh, before the manger? Today, we're looking at what Jesus did between the manger and the cross. So basically, his time on earth and his 33 uh, years of uh, the incarnate Son of God. And we're going to look specifically at uh, what Jesus was doing during that time. So let's uh, jump in and take a look here. Uh, what we're going to see is that Pretty much the, the the focus of Jesus's ministry was the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Both of those mean the same thing. Uh, so they may I may use those interchangeably as we go. And so what we see is that as Jesus comes on the scene, particularly in the book of Mark, and that's where we're going to focus today, um, is he announces a kingdom. And Mark is going to show uh, that that Jesus. Uh, is is talking about the kingdom of God a lot. He is inaugurating the kingdom, and he's going to demonstrate this in a couple of different ways. So he's going to announce the kingdom. Jesus is going to announce the kingdom in a couple of ways. Number one, uh, Jesus announces the kingdom by his words and preaching, kind of like what you would expect an announcement to be. And Mark 1 uh, kind of starts this after we get an introduction to John the Baptist, his ministry. Now Jesus comes on the scene, and it says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Uh, so the focus of Jesus' ministry is alerting the people to this kingdom that's at hand, um, preparing people, preparing the way for people to be able to become part of that kingdom. Uh, so he's going to preach about that quite a bit. He uses a lot of parables to explain, you know, the kingdom of God is like this. Um, and all of this is focused around the kingdom of God. But it's not just his preaching that announces the kingdom. Uh, it's also his miracles. Uh, his miracles give evidence of his kingly authority. Uh, so this is not just the vain words of a crazed man saying, hey, there's a kingdom and I'm the king, uh, but he is going to demonstrate through the miracles that he rightly possesses that authority even now. And so uh, let's take a look at about 10 different miracles again from the book of Mark uh, that really point to his authority and what he has authority over. Um, and so the first that we see coming right out of the gate is that uh, Jesus cast out an unclean spirit. Right there in Mark chapter one, he's in a synagogue, it's a Sabbath. And it, it, it appears that all of a sudden there's a guy, he's been there, he's been listening and he just kind of blurts out, you know, son of man, what do you have to do with us? You know, it's just this, uh, it, it's like they had been in there already and they were in his presence and it just got the best of them and they couldn't keep quiet anymore. And so Jesus cast out the unclean spirit and everyone in there is absolutely amazed at what's happening. And this is what we see in chapter 1, verse 27. Uh, and they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves, uh, themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. So what we can see from the first miracle recorded in the gospel of Mark is that Jesus has authority over evil forces. I think this is important because the kingdom of light is juxtaposed against the domain of darkness. And we see that the kingdom of God is coming and it is pushing away and it has the power to push away evil on planet earth. And Jesus is the one with that authority. So this is a significant moment and a significant amount announcement by miracle about who he is and what he's doing and what the kingdom is like. The second is uh, the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. And this is one of several divine healings, uh, many different aspects of uh, or parts of, of humans were healed uh, during his ministry, sight, uh, hearing, um, inability to speak. Uh, and in this case, we have fever. So some type of disease has uh, afflicted the mother-in-law of, of Peter. So yes, Peter was married. He had a mother-in-law. And after, right after the synagogue experience with the casting out of the demon, uh, Jesus and Peter go to Peter's house, 
and find uh, that the mother-in-law is sick. She's basically asleep or unconscious. Um, and uh, Jesus just simply comes in, takes her by the hand and lifts her up and the fever leaves her. And I love this, that uh, the Middle Eastern woman loves to serve and gets up and get, uh, begins to serve them to practice hospitality. And so we see his authority over disease. Uh, this is a significant thing, particularly in the first century Middle Eastern world uh, where medicine is very limited. And even today, this would be a big deal. Uh, we have many incurable things, uh, but Jesus has authority over even those kind of diseases. Uh, third, we see that, um, and, and this is an amazing and compassionate and wonderful thing, that Jesus touches and heals a man with leprosy. Uh, this just would not happen uh, for a number of different reasons. One, the contagion factor. Um, that it, it was a risky thing to touch a person with leprosy for fear of catching the disease. Second was the unclean factor, the being ritually unclean. So if you go back to the book of Leviticus, you'll see a number of different uh, diseases um, and ailments that could render a person unable uh, to go into the temple court. Um, so not only was the disease a, a discomfort to the person, it was also uh, a, a real hindrance socially, uh, religiously, on so many different levels. And I mean, this there, there was, this is given by God, and it, it is certainly um, uh, protocols that were meant to protect the community, but it was also intended to illustrate holiness and cleanness. Um, and, and so one of the th other things that you see in uh, the book of Leviticus very clearly is the direction or the flow of clean and unclean. If a person is clean or holy and they touch something that is unclean, like if they touch something dead, the uncleanness of the unclean thing is the dominant thing. It transfers to the clean person. So the clean person becomes defiled. Um, they've been affected. And so here is kind of that picture is that unclean is dominant. It corrupts, it, 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 um, it dirties uh, the clean object and renders it un unable uh, to be used or to participate in holy or religious activity. But notice that here is the Holy One of God. This is Jesus. And Jesus's cleanness is more dominant than the uncleanness of the unclean man with leprosy. I think this is a huge, huge thing, and it shows his authority to cleanse the unclean, not just physically, but spiritually as well. This is great news for all of us, because all of us have been defiled. All of us have willingly defiled ourselves. We've touched and participated in the unclean, but Jesus's cleanness is more dominant than our uncleanness. And so we see that as a result of him touching um, a very compassionate, I mean, how long had it been since he had been able to experience human touch, particularly in a kind way? Um, and not only did he have that kind of love and compassion, but that love and compassion also uh, led to his being healed, to being made clean uh, ritually as well. And it says that immediately the, le the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Mm, that's good. So uh, what we also see, uh, and this is a big one as to the identity of Jesus as well. In Mark chapter two, uh, this is that fun moment. Um, it's one of those great stories to tell to kids and even adults. Uh, they love to hear this if they've never heard it before. Uh, that moment when Jesus is back, presumably at, at Peter's house, and a crowd has gathered um, to hear him. Um, they've heard about what he did in the synagogue. They've heard about some of the other miracles that he's done. And there's these four friends that have the, the uh, their friend who is um, uh, been paralyzed uh, since birth, basically. I mean, it, it has been a, a longstanding uh, problem. And so they uh, are wanting to get to Jesus, but because of the crowd, they have to make a hole in the ceiling to let their friend in. And Jesus sees this and uh, sees the guy, but he also sees that the root issue is the sin of the, of the guy that's being let down. And so he tells him that your sins are forgiven. Uh, but the, the Pharisees and some others are kind of standing outside and they see what's going on. They're kind of thinking to themselves, who does this guy think he is? Nobody can forgive sin but God. 
Uh, and that's true. They're absolutely right. And so uh, look at verses 10 through 12 here. Uh, Jesus knows this, and he says to them, uh, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose immediately, picked up his bed, and went out. So notice that the main point of this miracle is not to make a, a paralyzed man walk. It's to show that his sins are forgiven. And more importantly, Jesus is the one with the authority to forgive sins. Nobody can forgive sins against God but God. And Jesus would not have the ability to forgive that sin if he were not God in the flesh right there. So this is a huge, huge thing, not only pointing to his authority as king, but to his identity as God and the ability to forgive sin. But here's the cool thing. Because this guy was healed, you can know that Jesus can and will forgive your sin if you turn to him. Then we have another moment in Mark chapter 3. Uh, we'll kind of continue just to kind of walking through chronologically through the book of Mark. Uh, we have another Sabbath moment, uh, turns into a, a confrontation this time uh, with the Pharisees because there's a man in the synagogue who has a withered hand. As you can kind of see in the picture here, it's, it's uh, immobile, it's kind of frozen, it's useless. Um, and, and, and so Jesus uh, just simply tells the guy to stretch out his hand. Um, and as he does, his hand is made whole. Oh my goodness, the, the Pharisees lose their minds because he's doing work on the Sabbath. Uh, I mean, it, it, and, and Jesus, you know, rebukes them in Mark chapter three, like, look, if you've got a, you know, livestock that falls in the ditch, you're going to work and get it out. How much more precious is a child of God to be able to do that? But notice that this is coupled right there at the end of Mark 2, uh, 28, uh, where Jesus makes this bold statement that the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, this is a, another one of those huge, huge statements that points to his deity, because only God has authority over the Sabbath, because God is the lawgiver. God gave the Sabbath laws and for Jesus to be able to usurp that or to interpret that in some way, uh, or even to be able to work on that, that day shows, again, more of who he is. But it shows that he has authority over the Sabbath. And even more broadly, he has authority over the law itself. Uh, so this is a, another one of those really, really big moments of revealing his kingly authority and how high that kingly authority really is. In Mark chapter four uh, is the moment where he calms the storm. Uh, so it's kind of that comical thing. Uh, they've been doing a lot of ministry. They get in the boat um, at Jesus's instruction. They start heading out uh, over the sea. Jesus goes to the back of the boat. He's tired. He goes to sleep and uh, this huge storm comes. These are seasoned fishermen. And this storm is terrifying enough that they think they're going to die. It's just that bad. And so they're terribly afraid. They go to Jesus and say, don't you care that we're going to die? Jesus gets up, simply stretches out his hand and says, peace, be still. And immediately everything stops. It's glass. The sea is, I mean, just absolutely calm. Uh, that would have been a cool thing to see, by the way. Uh, but it, 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 their response to that is pretty telling. Uh, because they were really afraid before, they're even more afraid now when they realize who's in the boat with them. And so look at uh, th this verse right here. It says, and they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? So when Jesus calms a storm, he has authority over nature. Uh, that all of Earth's nature, the universe's nature is under his control, under his authority, that he can just speak a word and it obeys. So we're seeing that the creator, as we saw that uh, previously in the, the person of Christ, who he is, Jesus is creator. Uh, Jesus is the one who created everything. There's nothing outside of his creation, uh, that there's nothing that hasn't been made, that hasn't been made by him. Everything has been made by him. Uh, John 1, uh, 1 through 3 uh, points very clearly to that, uh, and he still has that authority. 
He still has that creation authority over his creation. Then we get to Mark chapter 5. When they get over to the other side of the sea after this moment in the boat, uh, they encounter this uh, guy. He is um, terrifying. I mean, he's this guy that probably the neighborhood boys would dare each other to go and try to see how close they could get because he's kind of hanging out in the graves. Uh, He's possessed by demons. And we find out later that it's a legion of demons and probably in the neighborhood of 2,000, if not more, uh, that that are inhabiting this guy. Nobody can uh, contain him. They they try to put chains on him. He breaks the chains. He's running around naked. Uh, He is one scary dude. Um, And so uh, when Jesus um, uh, encounters him, he immediately begins to uh, cast out the the demon, and the demon's like, "Wait, wait, wait, wait! Please, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't send us into the abyss. You know, don't, don't make us leave the country. Look, there's this herd of pigs over here. Can we just go there?" And Jesus gives them per- permission, and there was a, there was a herd of some two thousand pigs, and so assuming that each pig got just one, and obviously demons can inhabit multiple in a single in, uh, being. Uh, And if they mean literally a legion and 6,000, then that would be about three per pig. But let's just assume one per pig. That's still 2,000 demons. And what we see is that Jesus's authority over evil and evil forces is absolutely unlimited. That even though humans could not control this one man, Jesus at a word set the man free. There are no demons too big in your life. There are not so many things in your world that are too big for Jesus. If you will turn to him, he has the authority to set you free. Um, and again, here's that, uh, that famous line. Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. It doesn't matter the legions that are in your life. Jesus has authority over all evil, and that, uh, that authority is absolutely unlimited. When he comes back over to the other side, there's actually a a couple of things that happen. One, there's a big crowd of people that are waiting for him. Uh, Jairus has sent some servants uh, hearing that Jesus is back. They push their way through the crowd and say, look, um, we've got this really important guy. His daughter is sick. Uh, Please come. Uh, He's a worthy man. Please come. On the way is when the woman who had had the flow of blood for about 12 years reaches out and just touches the hem of his garment, and she's immediately made well. Uh, He feels the power leave him. But again, it's one of those things where we see his authority over disease. Um, And now when he's getting close to the house, uh, he is informed that uh, Jairus' daughter is dead. And he says, look, she's not dead. She's only sleeping. They all laugh. They like you're you're ridiculous. You're you're deluded. He she's she's really dead. And so when he gets in there, uh, he just simply takes her by the hand and says Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. Uh, just as easy as waking a girl up from the from a nap is Jesus's authority over the dead. Hmm. That that's not a big thing for him. Uh, I mean, if you were to enter into the room of a child and say, it's time to get up. Now, some children are <laughs> sleep pretty hard, but still, it, it's that easy for Jesus. There's nothing impossible for him. His authority is supreme. He is indeed life. He is the resurrection and the life. Uh, as we see him exercise that authority in John chapter 11, when he raises Lazarus from the dead, and Lazarus had been dead so long that, as the King James says, he stinketh. Um, that his authority over death is phenomenal, um, and it is full. Um, Then we have in uh, Mark chapter 6, the moment that he feeds the the 5,000. Two chapters later is when he repeats that uh, supernatural miracle when he feeds 4,000 in a different location. Two different events, one with 5,000 men, the other with 4,000. Um, And he does this with just very limited resources, five little loaves of bread and two little fish. Again, another one of those very popular stories uh, of Jesus. But what we see is that Jesus has authority over resources and food, and that authority is unlimited, uh, that he can make a little go a long way. Uh, He is the creator of all things. 
And if something um, is not enough, <laughs> he can make it go farther. And if that thing doesn't exist, he can speak it into existence. Uh, he has authority over resources. Um, next, we see uh, Jesus walking on the water uh, later on in, in Mark chapter 6. And again, we see his authority over the rules of nature. Uh, he is not bound by the laws of physics. He is the one who wrote the law of physics. Uh, he is the one who has authority over the laws of physics. He has the authority over nature. He is not confined within nature. He is outside the creator of nature. And so he has authority over nature. He has the kingly authority over all domain, physical and spiritual. So here we, we've seen his authority, uh, his kingly authority, his announcing the kingdom. But he didn't stop with just simply saying, there's a kingdom, it's mine. He also provided for an entrance into the kingdom by his death. Now, we uh, just last week did a different video on that. So I'll leave a link uh, up here so that you can watch that and talking about what Jesus accomplished through his death. Why did Jesus need to die? And just some of the very different aspects of the atonement that you may not see. So just very quickly, though, uh, we see that he was announced as the sacrificial lamb at the very beginning of his ministry. So going all the way back to John chapter one, so kind of the beginning of his ministry, uh, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming and says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, so he was announced as the sacrificial lamb. Um, and then basically his three-year ministry was him being observed, uh, particularly in that last week leading up to his sacrifice. The Passover lamb uh, in particular had to be inspected. Uh, it had to be uh, watched and observed to make sure that it was without defect, that it met all the criteria, that it was not blemished. And so in Jesus's ministry, uh, he was watched, he was observed, he was critiqued, and so he was approved, so to speak, as a sacrificial Passover lamb. And so he was announced as that lamb, he was um, observed as that lamb, and it, this was really his mission in his life. His mission was to die. Uh, Matthew 20, 28 says, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus understood this. This is why he came. He understood this. He told people this, uh, that this is my very reason for coming. It is to die so that people can get into the kingdom. Because in and of ourselves, we can't. We are disqualified from the kingdom because of our sin. And Jesus came not only to announce uh, the kingdom, uh, but he also came to make the way for us to be able to become part of the kingdom. And so if you have never come to that place in your life where you understand that you're a sinner, that you need a savior and that savior is Jesus, can I invite you maybe to turn from your sin um, and begin to trust Jesus as your Lord and savior? Uh, if you want to know more about that, you know, please uh, leave me a con uh, comment or something and um, try to reach out to me. Be glad to talk to you more about that because this is really the most important thing that you could ever do. Uh, and then third, this kind of relates more to the future work of what Jesus is going to do, but it relates to his work uh, with the kingdom, is that he has announced the kingdom, he's made the way possible uh, for us to get into the kingdom, but he is returning to establish his kingdom as the sole and solitary kingdom on planet earth and the universe. Uh, and so we see that triumphal moment in Revelation chapter 19, um, where we see him coming on the white horse, his robe has been dipped in blood, and then it says in verse 16, on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is the moment that every other earthly kingdom is done away with. Every enemy of God is finally subdued and destroyed. And that finally righteousness and righteousness only exist within his kingdom. And so all of those who have not yet come to that place uh, at that moment where they have surrendered to his kingly authority, um, it's gonna be too late. 
And for those that have, those that have given their lives to Christ, they serve him. This is a great and glorious day. And this is the day that we look for. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Sooner is better for sure, because this world is nuts right now. And we need you to come. Um, so yeah, this is just kind of a quick overview of the earthly ministry of Jesus. Uh, if you've got any questions about that, I encourage you to just leave those in the comments below. If you like this, I mean, if it, it helped you in some way, if you don't mind, just like the video so that other people uh, might be able to see it. Kind of helps that YouTube algorithm to move that along. Um, again, we're not trying to monetize this channel. We are just trying to help uh, people learn more about who Jesus is, uh, what Jesus does, and how Jesus can make a difference in their life. And so um, if you would like, and if uh, you'd like to uh, stay in touch with uh, what we are talking about, let me invite you to also hit that subscribe button and notification bell. Uh, that way you can be alerted every time that we drop another episode like this. Hey, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to watch. It's an honor. I appreciate it. Uh, may the Lord richly bless you until we see you again. God bless.